Today I'm talking about The Way of the Cobalt Soul Monk from the Tal'Dorei Reborn Critical Role Book, today on Flute's Loot. I have an accompanying article on flutesloot.com where I've reviewed all of the Tal'Dorei subclasses and analyzed them. The Way of the Cobalt Soul was used famously by Marisha Ray during Campaign 2. She was trained in interrogation and investigation, which is a strange angle for monks. So let's see how well this subclass explores that fantasy. At third level, you get Extract Aspects. You strike pressure points to learn critical information from people. When you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can analyze it. So not just any of your attacks, your flurry of blows. Whenever an analyzed creature misses you with an attack, you can immediately use your reaction to make an unarmed strike against that creature if it's within your reach. So you effectively mark the creature as analyzed, and if it misses you with an attack, you punish it by reading its movement and you use your reaction to attack it. Additionally, when you analyze a creature, you learn all of its damage vulnerabilities, damage resistances, damage immunities, and condition immunities. I find, usually in combat, it's not difficult to figure those things out. Most monsters also don't have vulnerabilities because Wizards of the Coast, I think, knows that giving something a vulnerability is quite the death sentence, <laughs> so they don't do that very often. Damage resistances, you're often going to learn it has resistance to like non-magical damage from weapons or something like that, but at a certain level of play, you kind of just assume that. Damage immunities can be good. Probably the more useful one is condition immunities, though if you played enough, you kind of know what ghosts are immune to. So I don't think this is really that great, honestly, especially to tie it to your flurry of blows. So it effectively costs a key point because you have to do that flurry. You won't be able to do this with like a ranged monk. So there's just not much going for it at level three. Let's see if it gets better, but it doesn't. At level six, we get Extort Truth. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend one key point to force it to make a charisma saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is unable to speak a deliberate lie, and all charisma checks directed at the creature are made with advantage for up to 10 minutes. You know if it succeeded or failed on its saving throw. An affected creature is aware of the effect and can thus avoid answering questions to which it would normally respond with a lie. Such a creature can be evasive in its answers as long as the effect lasts. If you wish to impose this effect on a creature without injuring it, you can attack the creature to simply touch it, dealing no damage on a hit. So this is kind of like a zone of truth spell, which a lot of full spellcasters can get at level three. Interrogations are one of my least favorite parts of Dungeons and Dragons, so maybe giving an ability to speed that up is useful. <laughs> You can obviously learn a lot of good informational tidbits from Extort Truth, but for a 6th level feature, it's not something I look forward to or anything. Yeah, that's 0 for 2 so far. Also at 6th level, you get Mystical Erudition. You have extensively studied the history and lore within the archives of the Cobalt Soul, so you learn another language, and you gain proficiency with one of the following skills of your choice, basically all the intelligence skills. If you already have that proficiency, you can gain expertise to double your proficiency. As you level up at level 11 and 17, you get another language and skill skill at each of those levels. Once again, being able to get expertise if you double up on one of them. Okay, I like skills and languages. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't make up for the other level six ability. So I'm gonna go zero for three. This would have been a good ribbon feature if the other feature was better. At level 11, Mind of Mercury. Once per turn, if you've already taken your reaction, you may spend one key point to take an additional reaction. You can use only one reaction per triggering effect. So this is great if you actually use the deflect missiles feature of the regular monk, or if you are using the extract aspects ability of the Cobalt Soul Monk. Specifically, your ability to make a reaction attack against a creature that you've analyzed that is missing you with an attack. So if it misses you with multiple attacks, you can use another key point to still do another reaction to keep punishing it. More and more, I, I feel like you just need to get a lot of value if you're spending key points on subclass features, and this is not doing that. Monks don't have a lot of abilities, and this one is no exception to like enhance the damage of their attacks. Their martial arts dice will scale slowly, but that's about it. Like It doesn't work against you or anything, and it, you have to decide for yourself if you want to use the key to do another attack as a reaction as opposed to just waiting till your turn. I wish this subclass had more ways to use your reactions in the way that it's describing, so that this would be more worthwhile. The way of the Cobalt Soul does like intelligence skill checks, but if you are a, like let's say an abjuration wizard with counterspell, you could use Mind of Mercury to use your key points as a monk to fuel your extra counterspells. So an enemy might think that you're out of counterspells, but you are not. <laughs> I think that's super funny. And that could actually be kind of cool for like a high level one shot, something like that. Come to think of it, I'd, I'd actually really like that concept if the Cobalt Soul had more abilities that were based on its intelligence. Like I 100% think it should have had an ability that says you can use intelligence instead of wisdom for all your monk abilities. That would have been a very interesting choice. But alas, 
It didn't. If someone wanted to play Cobalt Soul, I don't want them to be bored out of their minds, so I would definitely let them do that. All right, one more feature at level 17, Debilitating Barrage. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend three key points to cause the creature to gain vulnerability to one damage type of your choice for one minute, or until the end of a turn in which it has taken damage of that type. If a creature has resistance to the damage type you choose, this resistance is suppressed instead of gaining vulnerability. So you can suppress the resistance, but it won't gain vulnerability. A creature that is immune to the damage type you choose is unaffected, so you can't get rid of immunity if it's already immune. And then you can't use this effect on that creature for another 24 hours. All right, so who's gonna get the most value out of this? It says that it lasts for one minute. That would be pretty crazy, but then it says until the end of a turn in which it has taken that damage type. So this this is a little bit interesting because you as a monk can do a lot of damage on a turn. It's It doesn't end on the first instance of vulnerable damage that the creature takes. If you have a wizard in the party who wants to cast Disintegrate twice using Action Surge or something like that, if they have multi-class with a fighter, you can make them vulnerable to two Disintegrate spells, for example. An Eldritch Blast at this level would have four blasts and they could be vulnerable to all the force damage or you could just make them vulnerable to your bludgeoning damage of unarmed strikes. This would have been more interesting a lot earlier. After all, the Grave Domain Cleric can make someone vulnerable to the next instance of damage at level two. You're already playing a monk, which has a lot of issues. Your cool ability, level 17, where most people are not playing anymore, is not great. I like the design choice though. Overall, I give the Way of the Cobalt Soul two out of five stars. I think it has some cool concepts that they really were too shy about, too reserved. I think they should have been more creative with it. And also, like I said, if you're playing in a game where your DM is using lots of monster vulnerabilities, resistances, conditions, then yeah, you might get a lot of value out of this, and you might be the savior of your party because you learn all the weaknesses of the evil monsters that you're coming across. But if you're just playing out of a Wizards of the Coast module, for example, I would not think you're going to get a lot of value out of this, unless you're all like brand new players, and you don't know how to make assumptions about certain creatures and the way that they mechanically behave, like a ghost I mentioned. Like, you're not going to really knock a ghost prone because it's just like this ethereal creature and that makes intuitive sense to us in the real world but you don't know if that translates to mechanics in game unless you've played for a while you could call it metagaming but i feel like it's just understanding mechanically how the world works that you're interacting with do you think i am incorrect about my rating for this subclass is there a lot more going for it and i think matt mercer used a lot of abilities and monsters that the players were not familiar with and so i think this got more mileage let's say don't forget to extract aspects on that like and subscribe button down below and check out my article in the description have a good adventure this weekend and i'll see you in the next video bye